Okay, welcome to another week of uh, science and technology Q&A for kids and others. And uh, happy to take all kinds of questions, easy ones, hard ones, ones you think are easy, ones that will turn out to be really hard, ones that you think are hard, which turn out to be easy, uh, different topics about science, technology, history of science, history of technology, um, future, etc. All right, let's... Um, Okay, so there's a question from Jack here. For a math and science career, what is the most useful subject to study in school, excluding math and science? Uh, what was my favorite non-science class or subject in school? Well, those are two different things, but, but the number one thing is understand computation. Understand computational language, understand computational thinking. Those don't, that isn't something that gets taught in current, quotes math and quotes science. It's something, and it doesn't get taught really in current quotes computer science. Computer science is really about these days, mostly, not always, it's slightly different things in different places, about kind of the care and feeding of computers as they are, so to speak. Um, the, you know, the thing I've obviously spent a lot of my life doing is building this whole stack of computational intelligence, this whole computational language, or from language, all these kinds of things that um, uh, are a way of getting it to the point where we can describe the things that we're interested in in computational language, and then it's up to the language to implement those things. So we can say, you know, if we're studying um, something about uh, some area of, I don't know, plant science or something, uh, the, you know, the, the language knows information about plants. It knows how to compute things about uh, these different questions that you have and so on. I would say that the, the number one, the zero thing probably to learn about is kind of the computational method. You know, how to think about things computationally, computational language as a way to take that computational thinking and actualize it as a thing that you can have a computer help you with and so on. So that I would say is the, the zero thing to get out of, uh, out of learning. And it, it's something which is still pretty embryonic in terms of what's taught in school, um, but that's a really important thing. And, uh, you know, even I've written a little book about, uh, uh, you know, uh, elementary introduction to Wolfram language, which, uh, you know, I think it's a pretty good book, um, but there are lots of, and there's a MOOC version of it and so on. But those, that's an example of the kind of thing that is, uh, is it, really worth learning because if, you've, if you really understand this kind of computational method that's made possible by our computational language and so on, this is a superpower basically. You can do things and I, it's always fun for me to see because there are plenty of people who know this stuff well now. It's always fun for me to see that they go into these different areas, they're interested in things, they take a class about this thing or that thing and suddenly they can just sort of uh, do all these amazing things with them um, uh, with these tools, and that's um, because they understand kind of the computational method and they understand computational language. So I would say that's sort of the zero thing to say about um, uh, about what um, uh, um, what one can um, uh, things to learn in school, so to speak. I would say that the um, uh, the other thing is uh, learning to sort of express oneself um, both. And that's kind of a story both in computational language and in natural language, in English or whatever language it is. Um, you know, learning to write and write well and explain yourself well, that's a super useful thing. Um, it's, uh, I don't know how similar it is, you know, explaining yourself well in computational language is uh, in some ways similar to explaining yourself well in natural language. It's all about kind of organizing your thoughts to the point where you can communicate them in the case of natural language directly to other humans, in the case of computational language, both to other humans and to computers. Um, but that's, uh, so I would say that, that um, learning to write computational language on the one hand and natural language like English on the other hand, these are really worthwhile things. I would say in general um, that, uh, uh, just, well, knowing about a bunch of different areas is just knowing facts about different areas is super useful. Like, uh, 
like, I don't know, I, I guess that I never thought I learned much about like history, for example, when I was in school, but actually it turns out I, I know sort of enough basic history that when things come up, I can sort of piece them together and understand uh, sort of how things worked. I mean, I, I myself happen to have been pretty interested in the history of science and technology. I'm just working on a little project right now that involves a bunch of history uh, in Europe around the 1920s and so on. And having some basic knowledge of what happened in the First World War and things like that is kind of important to not get utterly confused about um, uh, about um, about what went on in the particular piece of history that I'm studying. And, and I think history is a useful thing to understand, to sort of contextualize what, what's there today. Now, you know, I have to say when I was in school, um, you know, my learning of history, I didn't like at all. Um, I think perhaps because of uh, some details of, of how I sort of went through different years of schooling, I, I think I learned the history of the 1600s. Uh, I went to school in, in England and, you know, in England they teach, you know, every country teaches history differently. And, you know, in England, for example, you know, what in the US is called the American Revolution. But when I learned that in England, it was always called the American War of Independence. I mean, it's just a sort of a different perspective on the same set of events. But for some reason, I learned the history of the 1600s in England like three times. And I'm like, this is completely boring. I do not care about these dates. I don't care about these battles. I don't care about, you know, uh, you know, um, Charles I, Oliver Cromwell, the English Civil War, all these kinds of things. I, it just, I, it seems very remote. And um, even though, you know, some of the events happened in places near where I lived and so on, it's like, okay, there's a, there was a battle here you know, 350 years ago, and now there's a field. Great, terrific. Now what? Well, of course, in the way these things come around, um, in uh, I've done a lot on history of science, and the 1600s was a very important period in the history of science, and one that I've studied a lot with people like Newton and Leibniz, and sort of the beginning of mathematical science, and all those kinds of things coming in. And um, so it's, it's kind of, I feel a little bit silly for having been like, I'm not interested in the history of the 1600s when I was in school. Um, but I think that just knowing sort of basic facts about history, geography, all these kinds of things, you know, knowing basic facts about things is really useful. Um, I would say that that being to the point where you can really calculate things or do, uh, do sort of, uh, you know, I think that's having a, a broad knowledge of lots of facts is, is really useful. At least I've, I've always found it so. Another area that I have to say I didn't learn when I was in school is things about philosophy. Um, and I think that uh, uh, there's a lot that's interesting there about kind of ways to think about things. I mean, the fact is the, the kinds of questions Plato asked are still questions we might ask today. It's like I at times had thought, you know, why would one want to study something like Aristotle? You know, a lot of what Aristotle had to say about science is, is known to be complete nonsense. But it's actually interesting to look at the arguments that were made by people at different times in history, because you know what, if you're just sitting and thinking about these things by yourself, not informed by all those facts of modern science and so on, you would probably come up with the same conclusions. And it's interesting to unravel them and try and see why isn't that the right conclusion? Why, you know, how to think about those kinds of things. So I think this, I mean, a, a big theme is how to think about things is a super useful thing to learn in education and whether that's something you can get uh, from learning sort of philosophy. I mean, you can get, uh, I'm sure you can learn in a very formulaic way, which isn't so useful, but learning it as a way of, here's a question, how would you think through this question? That's a pretty useful thing. And it's true, not only for sort of the philosophy that directly affects science and technology, but also for things like ethics and so on, just kind of working through how do you think through a problem? Given this question, that's a, 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 a complicated question, how do you think it through? I mean, one feature of philosophy that differs from th something like science is that kind of anybody at sort of any stage of life can have opinions about sort of questions in philosophy. They may be more or less informed opinions, but they can nevertheless have an, opinions. Whereas if you ask somebody, you know, something about, um, uh, you know, what do you think about, um, uh, the Schrodinger versus Heisenberg pictures of quantum mechanics. Well, most people will have nothing to say about that until they've learned a whole stack of actual detailed content um, about, uh, about mathematics and physics and so on. Whereas 
uh, a similar question, you know, a question about philosophy, everybody can have an opinion, you know, given an ethics question, should the self-driving car do this or do that? You can have a whole discussion about that at sort of any, any level. And I think that's useful because I think learning to think about stuff is really worthwhile. I mean, learning facts, learning to think about stuff, learning to express yourself to humans or to computers, these are all really useful things. I mean, I think that, uh, uh, you know, when I was in school, I, I learned various languages other than English. I learned Latin and Greek, which I thought were just completely useless at the time, although I found them kind of fun. And I learned French, uh, which I also thought was pretty useless at the time. Um, and uh, Latin and Greek are interesting, partly because, well, Latin in particular, because it's, it's a bit of a simpler language than English, and it's a good excuse to kind of learn structures of languages and grammatical structures and things like that. Um, and that's that's good. And and for me, in practicality, I've, I've you know, I. I end up having to make up names for things and I end up trying to understand things in technical fields where the words come from Latin and Greek. So in fact, the knowledge that I have of those, of those languages is, is, is surprisingly useful to me, even though I thought it was gonna be quite useless 50 years ago when I was learning those things. Um, in terms of, of other human languages, you know, I think it, 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 my own experience of that wasn't particularly good. I mean, I, I can, read French and understand French. I'm, I'm always too nervous to actually speak it. And whenever I do, people kind of look at me like, and they start talking to me in English. So it's, it's like, um, uh, I think French is a particularly exacting language in terms of people's uh, willingness to, uh, to speak in the language because it's a language that, um, but, but you know, there, there's, a, there's a utility, I guess, if you get good enough to be able to actually understand other languages, it's, it's probably useful. I, I just haven't gotten to that point. People say, uh, I have no evidence for various claims that people make that, you know, learning human languages is useful for learning computational languages. I, I don't actually, I don't know if that's true. I mean, I know people have studied that question and, and say that people who learn computer languages, programming languages, a little bit different from computational language, but learn programming languages, also learn human languages well. If I'm an example, I'm not a good example. I've learned many programming languages and not many human languages. But I would say also, just in terms of things to do in school, I mean, another thing that I would say is, you know, doing projects and answering questions that you have where you can go and, for example, particularly using computational methods, um, you know, answer those questions, being able to go from formulate the question to do something to answer the question, this is a super useful thing to do. And a lot of times in school, the only thing you get to do is, uh, you know, here's a standardized thing to be told. Here's an exercise to do that's been done a million times before. Go do this exercise. And sometimes that's a useful thing to get practice, to get to, to, get to a certain level of, of fluency and understanding how to do things. But um, at least for me, it's like there's so much more mileage from having something where you thought of the question yourself. You're kind of motivated to get to the answer yourself. And you have the experience of both seeing what happens when you formulate a question and seeing what happens when you kind of get to the answer by all means necessary, so to speak. And um, uh, you know that means you might have to learn some different field that you didn't know anything about. You might have to learn this, you might have to learn that. Um, and uh, sometimes you have to go backwards and sort of say, well, I, I need to understand the basics of this thing that I've never bothered to understand before and, and then move forward from that. I mean, I, I guess that I find myself doing that um, you know, all my life, I found myself learning different kinds of things and, and constantly having to do that, find out that there are these different building blocks that are needed to learn a particular field. And oh, gosh, I don't know this thing. Well, I probably should have learned this thing 40 years ago, but I didn't. So, OK, so I can learn it now, whatever. Um, and it's kind of fun. And, uh, uh, you know, I think that's I mean, the, the very concept that you're going to do school and that's going to be the complete learning you do. And then you're going to go on and just execute whatever you learnt. I think that's uh, well. I think that, you know sometimes in some professions you might be able to get away with doing that. But I think I personally I have found it uh, very very nice to just keep learning stuff. And the more you learn, the more you know, and the more the easier it gets to learn new things. And the more the further you can get in my experience because at least projects I do, I'm constantly having to pull things from lots of different things that I learned at different times in my life. All right. <clears throat>
let's see, a bunch of questions here. So there's a question from the from Tungsten Squid, interesting name. Does a charged battery weigh more than a discharged battery? Oh boy, how to think about that? Um, ba, 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 ba. Do I know the answer to that question? Well, let me give you a way to think about that. Hmm. Um, let's not talk about batteries because batteries are kind of complicated. Let's talk about capacitors. Okay, so when you make an electric circuit, the main thing you might have in your electric circuit is, let's say you're making something where you're lighting a bulb. You have a battery that uh, produces, uh, and then you have wires, you have wires from the plus side of the battery, the minus side of the battery, to the two uh, sort of ports on the, on, the, on the light bulb. You connect it up and, you know, light bulb lights up. Well, what's happening there? Well, what's happening is the battery is generating a voltage. Voltage is kind of the force of pushing electrons, which make up electricity, pushing the electrons through wires. And as you, as those electrons are pushed through the wires, they, they get, there's a certain flow of electrons, a certain current of electrons that goes through the wires. And there's a certain resistance to the electrons getting pushed through the wires. That's the so-called resistance uh, of, uh, to electricity. And in fact, there's a sort of a, a basic formula in electricity that says, it's called Ohm's law, that says voltage equals current times resistance. And um, so that means voltage is sort of the force with which you have to push the electrons, with which you, like a battery, for example, is pushing the electrons. Current is the, the rate of flow of the electrons, the number of electrons uh, per roughly area per time that's flowing through the wire. And um, the um, uh, and then the, um, uh, the resistance is sort of how much you have to push to get how much flow of electrons through the wire. And um, so a, a very basic circuit just has a voltage pushing, a current of electrons, a resistance to, the, to that pushing. So there are, there are two other elements to sort of the uh, basic so-called passive circuits, things called inductors and things called capacitors. Um, I say a passive circuit because there's circuits where you just get from a battery, it's just like you're pushing and something happens. An active circuit tends to be one where you have things like switches um, in which uh, things like sort of electronically controlled switches. Transistors are a sort of basic kind of electronically controlled switch. In a transistor, one has the, it, the current can go through, the, it's like there's a, in the most common kind of transistor in modern computers is a field effect transistor, which has a source, a gate and a drain. So the source is a place where you're sort of putting the electrons in. The gate is a thing that's determining whether the electrons can go through and the drain is where the electrons come out. And so all of the kind of switching, all the logic that happens in computers, it all happens because you, can, you have this gate that depending on essentially the voltage at this gate, you either do get a flow of electrons through the transistor or not. That's an example of an active component in a circuit where you're actually actively doing something to determine whether the electrons are gonna go through or not. But in a passive circuit, there are resistors, inductors, and capacitors. Okay, so uh, the, okay, so what are these things? So a capacitor, usually they're, they're, they're different shapes, but usually they're little, they're little cylindrical things of different shapes. So when you, if you, if you, um, if you open up a piece of electronics, you'll find, um, that, uh, well, you'll mostly find that things are inside integrated circuits, just these little, these things where there might be millions or billions of mostly transistors uh, that are etched onto a piece of silicon and, and absolutely tiny, and you can only see them through a high power microscope, but they'll just look like a little plastic um, uh, thing um, with a whole bunch of metal legs on it. Um, that's a microprocessor or that's a, an integrated circuit, but they're also on, on a circuit board, there will also be uh, other components, um, some that look like little pieces of kind of wire-like things. Those are typically resistors. Then there are also things that look like are either little little um, like little boxes or sometimes like cylindrical things that maybe stick up. Those are capacitors. Um, there are also inductors. They have various different forms, but but basically inductors end up being loops of wire. 
Okay, so what are these things? Uh, well, a capacitor is basically a, a temporary storer of, 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 of electrons. Um, so what will happen is current will flow into a capacitor. The capacitor will just get more and more and more electrons in it. It will just sort of fill up and fill up and fill up. And then if you kind of let it, then it will let those electrons drain out of the capacitor again and make a, um, uh, make a current from those electrons draining out. So, so a good example of this was an old fashioned flash uh, before, before modern times uh, when people had, or sometimes they still do a big, big flash gun on a camera. You would, you would sometimes hear it charging up. It might make a high pitched noise as it did that, it would charge up, it would charge a capacitor. It has electric current flowing into a capacitor. And that, that means more and more electrons are ending up in this capacitor. More and more and more electrons end up in the capacitor. And eventually there's a lot of charge in the capacitor. And then you press the, the camera you know, button and then kaboom, all that charge is released all in one go. And it makes, uh, it, it, uh, makes the, the flash tube make a big flash. Um, so, so kind of the idea of a capacitor is it's a storer of charge. Electrons flow into the capacitor, they sit there because one sort of closed off the, the, um, uh, the, the exit from the capacitor. As soon as you open that, as soon as you open the wire that goes out from the capacitor, let's say, as soon as you, you know, open a, you might have a, an actual switch that you can move there or something, or a button you press or something like this. As soon as you open that up, the, the charge flows out of the capacitor. Uh, by the way, the, the um, um, uh, well, an inductor is something a little different. An inductor is is using um, um, magnetic field. I mean, it, uh, let's not talk about inductors. Um, the the um, uh, let's talk about capacitors. So, a capacitor is sort of a minimal storer of charge, like a battery. Now, batteries have ways to store charge that uses electrochemistry. That's a little different, but it's the same basic idea. So, the question we might ask is. Is a charged capacitor, does a charged capacitor weigh more than an uncharged capacitor? I think the answer is definitively yes. And the reason is it has more electrons in it. It's got stuff in it that an uncharged capacitor wouldn't have in it. And um, I think that the, um, uh, I'm trying to think about how one would know how this works, but yes, I think that's right. I think that the amount of charge, so the, um, the capacity of a capacitor is measured in this unit called farads named after Faraday. Um, and uh, there's actually usually a wide range from picofarads to microfarads to whatever of, of capacity. And um, I'm kind of thinking that, um, I think, if I'm not getting this wrong, that um, uh, literally the, the amount of additional mass in a charged capacitor will literally be the number of electrons that are in there that wouldn't otherwise be in there. And um, uh, you know, in, in a wire, in a, in a conducting wire, what's happening is that there are electrons that can actually move in the conducting wire. In a metal, so ordinarily in atoms, electrons, there's a nucleus of an atom, there's electrons, the electrons are sort of pinned, they're sort of in quotes going round, not really quite going round, but they're, they're hanging out around the nucleus. That's, that's the way atoms normally are. In normal materials, there's just a whole array of atoms um, and uh, um, those um, many materials are just a whole array of atoms and each atom has its, has its electrons hanging out around it. Now metals are special because metals have this feature that essentially the electrons, the atoms with the electrons are, are sort of close enough together that the, the clouds of electrons around the atoms kind of can merge. And so you get what's called in, in uh, solid state physics, the, a conduction band which is basically when the electrons get sufficiently sort of, uh, they get to a sufficient level of energy, they, they, get, they get to the point where the electrons can just, actually in a metal, that they, they're, they're just, they're pretty much, well, many of the electrons are just able to sort of freely go uh, through, the, through the, the solid material. So they're not, it's not like they're locked to a single, nucleus uh, to a single sort of, a, and everything is a bunch of separated atoms, it's more like the electrons can kind of roam freely through this material. 
And then what happens is that um, voltage is kind of putting, uh, it's putting an electric field um, into the material that is providing kind of a, a push. It's like a hill with a gradient where the, the electrons are rolling down this hill um, to, uh, uh, and that's what generates an electric current. By the way, when, when it comes to a semiconductor, so there are, there are insulators, which are things where the electrons are pinned to atoms and you can't make a, an electric current go through those easily, something like, um, uh, I don't know, a, a, a piece of wood or something will be an insulator. Um, or the air is an insulator, um, uh, those kinds of things. Then there are metals, which are conductors, where the electrons kind of roam freely and you just have to push them a little bit with a voltage. Any, any little tiny voltage is enough to push them, even if it's a, a, a arbitrarily small voltage, it'll still succeed in getting the electrons to move through the material. Then there's an intermediate case called semiconductors. Um, and semiconductors have the feature that the electrons can only roam free if they reach this conduction band and there's a band gap. And so the, your average electron doesn't reach that point and you need a particular voltage like six volts or something. It's different for silicon and, and different materials. You need a particular voltage to push those electrons into the conduction band so that they can kind of roam freely. But um, so that's, uh, um, uh, but, but um, uh, I think the, um, in the case of, uh, uh, what if you know what, and you move a bunch of electrons into some place that uh, serves as a capacitor, the capacitor will weigh more, not much more, but a bit more, I think. Um, okay, let's see. It's a question from Mahmoud here. Um, first question about is mathematics invented or discovered? That is a long and very interesting question about which I have lots to say. Um, but uh, let's go on to the second part of your question. How can one measure atomic number for every element, electron mass and speed? Okay. So, okay, first of all, chemical elements, hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Each of these different chemical elements, these are essentially the different kinds of atoms that exist in the world. And they, they differ by the number of protons in their nucleus. So hydrogen has one proton in its nucleus, helium has two, lithium has three, beryllium has four, and so on, all the way until you get to uh, uranium with 92, and then you get up to, I think we've got to about 120 now. I'm, I lose track a little bit. They're very unstable elements, and uh, there's always new ones being discovered. Um, but uh, each one of those elements, the, the number is the number of protons in its nucleus. And um, so there's a question of uh, kind of how can you deduce how many protons there are in the nucleus of each element? Well, people did that in the past, particularly in the 1800s, by studying the chemistry of each element because the number of protons, when you have a neutral atom, the protons have plus one charge each, electrons have minus one charge each. So when you have a neutral atom, you have an equal number of protons and electrons. So that's kind of a, a um, uh, and, and by sort of studying how, how electrons get sort of uh, in, a, in a chemical compound, get kind of borrowed by one uh, nucleus and, and uh, uh, rather than another nucleus and so on, you can kind of piece together the whole periodic table of what the atomic uh, numbers of the elements are. Now, the other quantity is atomic mass. The atomic mass is the total mass of the protons, neutrons, electrons in a, in a, in a, um, um, in a in an element in, and um, the number of neutrons is not necessarily the same for all, let's say you have something like helium, there are two uh, stable isotopes of helium. They both have two protons, but one of them has one neutron, the other has two neutrons. Uh, it's helium three because it has a total of three protons and neutrons in its nucleus and helium four, which has a total of four protons and neutrons in its nucleus. So as a question of how do you measure the atomic mass, that is the protons and neutrons, and the, the most common way to do that is with a thing called the mass spectrometer. And essentially what happens in a mass spectrometer is that you are, uh, well, in sort of simplest case, you're, you're sort of breaking everything up until it's individual atoms. And then you are basically uh, accelerating those individual atoms by using an electric field and, um, uh, this is a little hard to explain, but basically what's happening is 
you're making uh, these individual atoms, you're, you're making them kind of, it would have been easier to explain this. 30 years ago, this would have been a lot easier to explain because 30 years ago, everybody had televisions that were cathode ray tubes. They had televisions that worked by having at the back of the television, there was a sort of hot wire that would produce a stream of electrons and the electrons would, would just go freely through vacuum inside this, this glass, uh, um, this glass, uh, uh, well, usually called tube, but, but um, of the television, this kind of glass fishbowl type thing of the television would go freely through this vacuum from the, from the kind of hot thing at the back that's just streaming out electrons. Um, and uh, then the electrons would be pulled towards the front, towards the, the screen that you can see by, uh, um, a, uh, um, by an electric field. And usually there was about thousands of volts between the front and back of the tube, so to speak. And those thousands of volts were pulling electrons, in this case, not through a wire, but through a vacuum. The electrons were going through there. And as the electrons went through there, there will be these deflection plates that would be able to say, okay, this, as, as you scanned down the lines on the television screen, it's like at this place, we don't want an electron to land on the screen. We want it to be black there. So we deflect the electron away. Uh, when it gets to this point, as it scans, we, we want to have the electron fall on the screen. And then the screen would light up in the places electrons fell on it by having a phosphor that would have the property that, that um, when an electron would fall on the back of the phosphor, you would see a, a light on the front of the phosphor and that was a television screen. Okay, so that's how, that's how televisions used to work, but that's not how televisions work today. Televisions work today using solid state electronics and using either liquid crystal displays or, or um, OLEDs, organic light emitting diodes. Um, and uh, the, um, uh, uh, so, so that piece of like, everybody knows how, how that works doesn't really, isn't really a good explanation anymore. But basically in a mass spectrometer, you're doing something that's a little bit like what I was describing with a television, except that instead of having a stream of electrons, you have a stream of whatever atoms you're trying to analyze. And when you are, are kind of, when, when the, you're accelerating these atoms and you're then deflecting them with a certain force of deflection and depending on their mass, they'll be deflected more or less. That's, that's, that's basically how a mass spectrometer works. And the result is that for any material, you can take any material and you can just like, like say, well, what are the chemical elements? What are the, how much of each chemical element is there in that, in that piece of material? And so you can find out, you know, your random piece of, uh, I don't know, um, uh, random, whatever it is, piece of metal, piece of food, you know, uh, gemstone, whatever it is, you can just figure out how much of each chemical element is in there. And in fact, it gets even more subtle than that because you can figure out how much of each isotope, things with different numbers of neutrons uh, it, for a given element are in there. And, and that gets really, really subtle because for example, um, when, uh, if you have a deposit of, I don't know, um, pick a material, I don't know, tantalum, niobium, even gold, whatever, um, in different mines, the, uh, when the earth was formed or when geological processes formed the rock in those mines, it, it, in, in each different place, there were slightly different processes. And so the, the, the fraction of different isotopes will be slightly different. So you can kind of tell which mine something came from by using a mass spectrometer to find out how much of each of these different isotopes actually occur. All right. There's a question about the, the book about history of computation. I'm never very good at coming up with these instant recommendations for books. Um, um, there are a bunch of books about the history of, I have a whole, several shelves of books about the history of computing. Um, I always find it really interesting to actually look at the original books um, from like the 1950s and so on. Uh, you know, there were all these books about giant electronic brains, which were kind of the metaphor for computers back in those days. And it's kind of interesting to see, you know, what's changed, what hasn't changed, what have people understood, what have people not understood. I would say the history of computing, um, there are a number of books about it, but I, I would say not some, um, 
Uh, history of computing is is it, it's a little complicated because the you know it's an interweaving of intellectual developments with commercial developments with engineering developments and they're all kind of woven together and I'm not sure that that, that it's um, uh, that there's a great kind of um, uh, untangling of all those different effects um, because you know you can talk about the abstract developments of computing but actually you know, a lot of the real steps that were taken were taken, you know, when the IBM 360 mainframe computer existed, when, you know, the Sun workstation existed, when the Unix operating system was developed, all these kinds of things. These are, these are the big steps were often real projects done by real companies and so on. Um, and uh, uh, that, that it's the, the commercial history ends up getting quite entangled with the, with the intellectual developments of, the, of these things. And that's sometimes hard for um, uh, to to get handled well in kind of uh, historical narrative. I mean, I would say that um, uh, there's a there's a very nice computer history museum in Mountain View, California, that has done a very nice job of of um, kind of telling the story of um, of uh, sort of the the of, of at least the technological side of the, of the computer. Uh, developments of computers. I mean, for me, it's it's kind of a laid out historically. For me, it's kind of fun because it's like, um, uh, uh, you know, you go through there and there are computers from before I used computers. And then suddenly there's this transition and all the computers after that point are sort of my personal friends, so to speak. It's like, yes, I use one of those. I had one of those, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's kind of, it's kind of a fun thing of, of uh, for, for me, at least it's like there's this particular moment in time in basically the mid to late 1970s, where sort of everything after that time, yep, been there, seen that type thing. And it, it's uh, sort of fun to, to, to see that. Um, okay. Um, okay, there's several physics questions here. Okay, from Camaro. If it's true that sound can be transmitted more easily in solids compared to gases, why can we hear better through air compared to through walls or glass? Okay, interesting question. All right, the basic answer um, is that, okay, what is, first of all, what is sound? Sound is a series of compression and expansion uh, sort of, a series of compressions and expansions. It's a wave of comp where, where you go up, you know, is compression, down is expansion and so on. So when I talk, what's happening is there's air that my vocal cords are moving and that's uh, that, that it's progressively being compressed, expanded, compressed, expanded. So if I were to, like, if you play a, um, uh, a middle C on a piano, then about 256 times a second, the air for the piano string will vibrate and the air around the piano string will be progressively, successively expanded, contracted, expanded, contracted, and so on. And the feature of the mechanics of these things is that when there are those series of expansions, contractions, it, it propagates, it moves. So, so what was a, an expand, a rare, you know, if, if I have my loudspeaker cone here or my piano string here that's, that's going back and forth, that's, that's generating um, air that will move at the speed of sound, that, that series of, of compression expansion uh, um, regions will move at the speed of sound through air, okay? So in a first approximation, with air, with a gas, if I play different notes on a piano, uh, 88 notes on a piano, they range, that's what, five octaves or something? That's a factor of um, uh, 32 or something in frequency. That means that at the low end, you're dealing with, oh, how low is it? Maybe a hundred, uh, maybe, I don't know how low it gets, maybe a few tens of vibrations per second at the high end, well, the high end of, of like um, human uh, is a few thousand vibrations per second. And, and we can usually hear, if there are younger people listening to this, you can probably hear up to about 25,000 uh, vibrations per second. Old fogies like me, well, it moves down 20,000, 15,000 uh, vibrations per second and so on. Um, 
that's you're, you're hearing through these little uh, these little hair cells inside the, the your inner ear that are being uh, as those pieces of com compression expansion compression expansion it will move the hair cells back and forth, and the hair cells uh, are such that as they move they generate an electric they generate a little voltage, and that voltage causes essentially an electrical effect to go down the auditory nerve, which is what causes us to hear things. Okay, but in any case, so, so the way that sound works, it's this compression expansion, compression expansion, um, you know, many, many times per second. Okay, so one of the issues is different sounds, like if I make a very low sound, low frequency, a few vibrations per second, if I make a high frequency, there's more vibrations per second. Um, okay, in air, the, the, the extent to which uh, those different sounds can go through air, it's pretty much the same, first approximation, uh, independent of whether it's a low frequency or a high frequency sound, the, the sound wave will manage to get through the air. Okay, the same is not true for things like solids. In solids, there are frequencies that are well conducted, and their frequencies are not well conducted. So for example, in a solid, uh, okay, so, so what's roughly happening, oh boy, let's see. Yeah, I mean, basically the issue is in, in, um, uh, in, a, in a, the question is, you make a sound. Eventually the sound, uh, and the, the sound let, let's say you were able to sort of direct your sound in one very specific direction. Even so, eventually, the these compression expansion, compression expansion, these things eventually, as you move these through the air, eventually they'll die out. Eventually, the um, uh, viscosity in the air, um, the um, the fact that the air is not doesn't um, if you if you try and move it with a certain force, it doesn't quite respond. It, it, there's a certain amount of friction, in a sense, um, internal friction in the air. That causes it to not uh, not respond as much as you you push it and doesn't quite respond as much as you push it. Well, the same thing happens in solids, except it's more more significant there. And you know, you you try and vibrate a solid, and to what extent are the vibrations going to go through the solid? Well, it depends on the frequency of the vibrations, the extent to which they'll go through the solid. So it tends to be the case that lower frequencies go through solids pretty well. So you're you're able to um, have uh, um, uh, you're able to you know if you if you bang on you know slowly on one side of a, a, a you know something solid thing you can kind of uh, you know the the banging you know can be heard on the other side but high frequencies um, do not successfully they go through solids they they get sort of and something essentially friction damps them out very quickly and that's why uh, you know it works to have kind of a um, um, uh, it, it works to, you know, have a wall that will prevent you hearing certain kinds of things. Now, you know, the absorption of sound is a complicated issue. And for example, something like acoustic tiles that you'll see on ceilings, they, uh, there are different ways to absorb sound. And um, that, that essentially the, the um, uh, that's one way. And another surprising way that works surprisingly well is, is books and bookshelves. You might say, why on earth would a room full of books uh, why would that be a really good, why would there be a bit good absorption of sound in that room? So the thing's called Helmholtz resonators, effectively. What happens is, essentially, the sound waves get, you have books on a bookshelf, and there's some space above the books um, uh, before you get to the next shelf. And essentially, what's happening is the sound is getting in through that space, and then it's rattling around behind the books and never gets out again. And that's, um, so it's, it's kind of a, an almost mechanical reason for the absorption of sound. So there are all kinds of different things that lead to the absorption of sound. In solids, sound is just attenuated by virtue of the fact that the solid has some resistance to being uh, to being moved in a way that, that in the air, it's like you have an expansion way, a piece of expansion, compression, expansion, compression, that's fine, it goes through the air. But if you try and do that with a solid, the solid will resist and will damp that out. So that's a sort of a rough story of why, um, even though when there are these, these um, uh, uh, when you do get vibrations going through a solid, the speed at which the vibrations will go through is higher than the speed at which vibrations will go through a gas like air. But 
but many vibrations, particularly the higher frequency ones, will get will get damped out by the by the essentially the rigidity of the solid. Uh, so that's 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 a um, uh, a quick attempt. I'm not sure if I've forgotten any any big effects there, but I think that's a quick attempt to explain that. Um, a question from I see here, why are mirrors made with glass? Would a mirror made with a different material have different reflective properties? Okay, so what is a mirror? So what a mirror has to do is has to take something like light and reflect it. Well, there are, let's just see roughly what there are mirrors for. So let's imagine that you had, uh, you had ripples on water, on the surface of water. And these ripples are sort of traveling as a wave, they're wiggling the water and they, they hit a wall. There'll be a reflection of those ripples from the wall. As the water hits the wall, it will, it will have um, a certain, there'll be water that's going up and down at the wall and that water that's going up and down at the wall will lead to water that goes up and down in the direction. And so, so as, the, as the, the, the sort of the water wave comes in here, it'll get reflected out, out there. So, so waves in general tend to get reflected from things unless they're, unless they're completely absorbed. In the case of light, uh, the reflection metals reflect light. That's the basic phenomenon. And the wider metals reflect light. Okay, so what's basically happening is that as the light, the light is an electromagnetic wave. It has pieces of electricity and magnetism that are wiggling in the case of visible light they're wiggling about a trillion times a second. Um, it's uh, there's sort of a, a a change of electric field, magnetic field, a trillion times a second. That's what a light wave is. When a light wave, uh, when when you shine light on a metal, what's happening is that those electric and magnetic fields they will move the electrons around inside the metal. So as soon as that light wave hits the 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 metal. It's like wiggling electrons in the, in the surface level of the layer of the metal. It's wiggling them really fast, a trillion times a second. Well, one of the features of, of wiggling electrons is when you wiggle an electron, it produces an electromagnetic field. So the electromagnetic field has the effect of wiggling the electron, but the wiggling of the electron also produces an electromagnetic field. So the electromagnetic field, which is the light wave, comes in here and it wiggles electrons in the material and that wiggling of electrons produces another light wave that's going out, and that's what leads to the reflection. So in the case of um, a, uh, a metal, um, in, uh, uh, metals will reflect specularly in the sense that light wave comes in, and it's almost like, a, uh, like a, you can almost think of it like photons bouncing off, photons of light bouncing off the metal and being bounced back. So if there's a certain angle that they come in at, they'll be bounced back out at the same angle, sort of on the opposite side, that so-called specular reflection. It's the same thing as what would happen, you know, you have a billiard ball, you, if you are any good at doing these kinds of things, you shoot it at the side of the table, there's a sort of springy thing and it will bounce off specularly, it will with an equal, equal angle. So that's that's what happens in in um, that's that's the form of reflection that you get from uh, from a metal, and and that's a consequence of the fact light wave wiggles electrons around. The wiggling of the electrons makes makes another light wave, and and insofar as the the wiggling of those electrons is is completely kind of without friction, insofar as it, like light wave comes in, it wiggles electrons. They just you know produce another light wave. Then you will get the specular reflection. Now, most materials that aren't sort of perfect conductors, perfect metallic conductors and so on, don't uh, have quite that same behavior. And they can have, in general, you can have a very complicated pattern of, um, okay, so, so for example, with a, with a specular reflector, you get light, light comes in, light sort of bounces off like a billiard ball. The opposite extreme is a diffuse reflector where light comes in and the light comes in and then the light that comes out comes out at all angles, sometimes called the Lambertian reflector. Um, and uh, so a, a typical kind of um, uh, surface that is, um, uh, yeah, I should have explained, right, it's a little complicated that the, okay, okay, let me explain another point. This idea that the light bounces specularly off depends on the fact that the surface of the material is completely flat. So, in other words, the thing comes in and it bounces off. If there was a little ridge 
on the thing that was was uh, that was there, the geometry would all be different. And so it would come in, it would hit the side of the, the photon effectively, it would hit the side of the ridge, and its version of what, what counts as a specular reflection will be different from what you would imagine it would be because it isn't it isn't flat to the surface of your mirror it's got little ridges on it and so on so in order to have a sort of a perfect mirror you have to have something that's been sort of perfectly polished to be completely uh featureless and, and that's why when people make i don't know mirrors for i don't know like the hubble space telescope um you know they're, they're very carefully making them perfectly perfectly flat and sometimes when people when people one of the tricks for making mirrors for telescopes is you take mercury, which is a liquid metal at room temperature, and you literally spin it. And the surface that it makes actually is a conveniently a, a paraboloid, which is the right shape to make kind of a, the right thing for a telescope mirror. But that, that will make you the sort of the, just the, the surface of the perfect surface of this liquid metal will make you a good mirror because it's, it's sort of perfectly flat. So in addition to the fact you have to have this metal, which has the electrons that can move freely, you also have to have it be perfectly flat. But in any case, sort of the opposite limit is something where, I don't know, it's like a uh, something that is, um, uh, well, very rough on the surface or not a metal. Um, it will be, uh, uh, you'll have this diffuse reflection. Actually, what really happens is light comes in and light goes out again in sort of a cone that isn't precisely in the specular direction, but it's kind of spread out like a plastic, for example. Typically, light will come in and the light which comes out will spread out in a certain cone. And in fact, people, there's both the physics of this and there's also, this is in computer graphics, the big issue is shaders in computer graphics, where you're trying to work out what will the simulated effect of light on something be. And it's a, it's a very important thing in making realistic looking computer graphics for movies and things is how that how the reflection of light really works, how the lighting really works. I mean, you, you might think, you know, that when you make a, a, a real movie with actual people with big lights around and shining them on, you know, actors and things like that, you understand why in the credits, there's all kinds of credits to people who do lighting and, and the electrical stuff for lighting and so on and so on and so on. But then when you see an animated movie, there's often in the credits also a lot of stuff about lighting and so on. And you say, how could that possibly be? I mean, who's moving a light around? Well, the answer is it's a complicated art to get things to look right um, with respect to having uh, light fall on simulated things in, a, in, a, in computer graphics. And over the course of time, people figured out uh, different kinds of tricks for making things at least look right in terms of how light is reflected. So for example, back, um, well, there's things, uh, they have names, Fong shading, Goro shading. These are all tricks for kind of making things that look like certain kinds of materials. They'll use some, some instead of having things precisely specularly reflect, there'll be a sort of power law of, you know, oh, the 10th power is good for plastic and things like this. Different, different materials have these different uh, sort of scattering characteristics of, of how the light comes out, how light, even when it shines in, in one beam at a particular angle, how it will come out. And then there are much more complicated things like skin and hair. Those were really complicated to figure out because the way that they reflect light depends on the fact that there are features of skin, for example, in, in the case of skin, one of the complicated things is that light is not quite all reflected from the surface of the skin. The, the light penetrates a few layers into the skin and some of it is reflected deeper and so on. So that gets complicated. In the case of hair, it's complicated because every strand of hair is kind of separately, um, uh, is, is uh, uh, well, and the sizes of hair um, are not so far off from the wavelength of light. And so you get all kinds of effects from that and so on. If you're a if you're something like a um, um, a chameleon, you're really using these effects of um, wavelength of light being similar to the, um, uh, the the in that case it's a, it's cells in the in the skin of the chameleon that allows it to change color and so on. But in any case, so so it's a it's a complicated issue how you get um, um, how you deal with these sort of different ways that light is is reflected from different kinds of materials. Um, and very important for making things look realistic and so on. It's kind of like, you know, when we when we perceive things, color is one important aspect of what we perceive, but we also perceive textures of things. We understand pretty well how eyes see color in terms of red, green, and blue. We understand much less well how eyes see texture 
there's probably some some limited set of sort of feature detectors for texture, just like there are three different color detectors in our eyes. There are probably some number of texture detectors. We don't completely understand how that works. It's probably partly in the retina, uh, uh, the actual sort of light sensing part of our eye, and partly in the first levels of visual processing in our brains um, that that works out. Um, but that's kind of a, uh, uh, so that's a, that's a rough story. And I think the, um, um, the question about mirrors, um, yeah, and, and depending on what material a mirror is made from, there are, there are all kinds of complicated things you can do with mirrors, and there are mirrors that change um, the polarization of light. Uh, when I talked about these electromagnetic fields and sort of a wiggling of the electromagnetic fields, there are different directions in which that wiggling can happen, and those correspond to the polarization of the light and that can also be affected by how it's reflected and so on. There's a, a long and interesting story about that for people, um, the things called Stokes parameters, which are um, uh, the, the kind of the fancy, you know, electromagnetic theory version of how you characterize how a light wave gets reflected from, from something and so on. Lots of interesting physics there. All right, let's see. Question here, which was a, uh, from Udesio. Uh, what was my first computer? Well, the first computer I saw was from a distance in probably 1969 when I was kind of like nine years old. And it was a mainframe computer that was only, you know, it was a giant computer the size of a room that um, uh, was only sort of operated by people in kind of white coats and so on. Um, first computer that I uh, put my own fingers on and programmed was a computer called Elliott 903C. And it was a computer that's about the size of a desk. It was a computer that had, um, uh, it was about hmm, a thousand times slower, 10,000 times slower than today's computers. It had about, uh, it had 8,000 words of memory, 8,000 words of 18 bit memory. So that's about 24 kilobytes of memory. So a very small amount of memory ferrite core memory. So every individual bit of memory was a little tiny magnet effectively um, that was all sort of threaded together. And um, you programmed it with, with paper tape um, and a uh, uh, little this paper with, with holes punched out of it. Um, and that was uh, programmed in a language in its, in its assembly language in its um, um, uh, essentially its machine code um, and that was that was the first computer I used. Um, then um, after that, I it was sort of a trade off in those days because that was a computer that was in. Yes, it was in a sort of well, there wasn't a lot of air conditioning, but it was a sort of air conditioned room, sort of out on its own. But um, uh, you know, the question of when there was a computer that could be out in the wild, not in a very special environment, that was a different thing. And the computers often computers would be computers that one used at a distance. Um, most often, well, in the, in the big computers, it was usually with cards where you would type up your cards on a card punch. You'd make a big stack of cards, be careful not to drop them because they were really a mess to reorder if you dropped them. You put them in a, you know, a pigeonhole, wooden pigeonhole usually. Somebody would take them out, run them through the computer and put back a printout of the results that you got. Um, that was kind of a common way to use big computers. Then another thing that started to exist back Oh, when I was, this must have been 1976, 1975, 1976. Um, yeah, I mean, I, a sequence of computers that were my personal friends, so to speak. But um, another thing was starting to exist was, was things called VDUs, visual display units, otherwise known as things which actually had visual display, like televisions that... Um, uh, allowed you to actually see characters you were typing in rather than just you type it in cards, you give it to somebody, the results come back. But so um, uh, by the time there were VDUs, um, visual terminals, um, there started to be, so I, I then started using computers. Uh, well, when I was like 16 years old, I worked at this government lab in England and they had um, a whole fancy setup for doing um, uh, for having terminals where you could get sort of somewhat real-time access to a computer. You didn't tend to run your programs 
you know, it wasn't like you typed a program in and, and it ran right there. You would you would set up your program and then you sort of tell it submit the job, and um, then it would run the program. And then 15 minutes later, or an hour later, or something, you get the results back. Um, at the same time, actually, I also started using. I used a desk calculator, which was an electronic thing, I think made by HP, that was more of a like a a, a very big version of a calculator. Um, and uh, where you could write programs and it had little magnetic cards that you could write programs on and had a, a, a pen plotter that allowed you to make essentially graphics by literally having a pen that would be controlled to move on a piece of paper. Um, and uh, I made a bunch of, bunch of things with that. Then the first computer, what was the first computer I owned? Um, I think the first computer that I owned was, oh, I'm trying to think about this. Um, well, I, yeah, mostly I used computers that I sort of had uh, that were, that I didn't personally own, um, but uh, were just at labs, universities, whatever. Um, sometimes there were computers that, you know, I controlled in some way or another, but I didn't personally own them. They weren't, um, um, I did, um, uh, I started using, well, I used, uh, oh gosh, lots of kinds of computers, but I, 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 I often used computers remotely. I mean, I used computers through the ARPANET, which was a predecessor of the internet back in 1976. Even from England, I was using computers in the US that way. Um, but uh, I think after a while, I started using, um, uh, probably by 1978, I, I used to use computers and I used to have a, dis a terminal um, that was usually, you know, 80 characters across, 24 lines down. Um, that had to be that that would just be sending commands to a computer. Um, but uh, the um, uh, you could do that through a phone line, and I would take a terminal, take it home, connect it to a phone line through one of these acoustic couplers, where you are actually using the sound on the phone line to send data. And the, the amazing thing was the phone system, at least in the US or in California or where I was that time, was sort of good enough that you could literally leave the thing connected for months at a time and it would never get any data errors. And you could just, you know, you come back and you start typing on this terminal and it's all connected and you're connected to your computer and you can do things. Anyway, the first computer I think I owned personally was probably an Osborne One, which was, a, which was an early portable computer the size of a small suitcase. Um, and it had floppy disks and things. And I, I actually have to say, I didn't use it very much. It was, it was kind of annoying to use relative to the, the sort of big computers that I, that I had access to. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so I could, go through, I could go through the whole series of, of computers in my life, so to speak, but I think it probably gets a little bit um, uh, long in the tooth after a while. So I should probably stop, stop there. All right. Let's see, a question from Sylvester about morphic resonance. I don't I have no idea what that is. Um, question from Parmenides. How long have I known Don Knuth? Don Knuth is a person, uh, sort of uh, computer science, kind of one of the kind of uh, uh, distinguished old school of computer scientists. How long have I known Don? Probably since the late 1970s, I think. Um, Don, He's written this, uh, he's done many things, but he's written this well-known book, collection of books about the art of computer programming. And uh, I kind of, um, um, uh, it's kind of one of those life planning kinds of things. He started writing an eight volume series of books back in about 1968. And he reached volume three fairly quickly. And he's been working on volume four for years since then. And I, I'm afraid he's, he's quite old at this point. And I, I, uh, Kind of, I'm hoping he's going to get it all done, but but you know, volume four has expanded so that I think volume four is now in many, 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 many sub volumes. And I think the problem is that back in 1968, when he started all this stuff, the field of computer science and what there was to say about different computer algorithms was really a very small field. Um, now it's two things have happened. First, it's a much larger field, and secondly, I think Don has gotten more and more into the details of more and more things and has just discovered more and more stuff. And it's like the, the, the project is, is like expanding. You know, it's not clear that the, that the project is a convergent project. I think it may expand faster than, uh, than the years go by, so to speak. Um, 
but I think the um, uh, it, it's um, it's something where, um, in, as, as somebody myself who's who's been involved in doing large projects, this is this is one of the kind of things that is like a uh, be careful what you set up because you know you set up a sort of table of contents. You say I'm going to execute this table of contents. How long is it going to take? Like I wrote this big book called The New Kind of Science. I started it in 1991. I wrote down the table of contents and I thought, okay, I'm going to fill out this table of contents. Turns out these sections, which I thought, oh, I'm not going to have much to say about that. Turns out I had lots and lots and lots to say about it. So that table of contents, 12 chapters, ended up taking 10 years. Um, and, uh, you know, I discovered lots of things that I'm pretty pleased with. And, uh, you know, I think that book has uh, been and continues to be a very sort of successful thing. But um, it's still, it's like you set up the table of contents, you start writing it. And like, if you are fixed on your table of contents, then, um, uh, then it may take a while to finish it if it's an ambitious table of contents. Kind of like when we do big software releases, there's always a continual discussion in our company. Is there a release where we say, there's this particular set of features that have to go into this release? Or is this a release that must come out on this particular date? And it's always a trade-off and it's always sort of a compromise between those kinds of things. But Don has set up for himself this, uh, uh, this table of contents, which um, I, I just hope he manages to, to work his way through because it's, it's um, uh, the numbers, the analytics don't look so fantastic, but, um, uh, but, but um, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing to have a, have a project like that that has such, such ambitious goals. The question from uh, Mustachio, noting that I went to Oxford and Caltech, would I recommend these schools? Well, first you have to realize that I went there a long time ago um, and I was on the faculty at Caltech for a while. And, um, uh, you know, I've, I've, I, I went to these schools uh, 40 years ago, more than 40 years ago, 44 years ago in the case of Oxford. Um, so, you know, much has no doubt changed. Some has stayed the same. I think, you know, the thing to understand about, about colleges, schools, universities, whatever, um, is, you know, people think, oh, there's this thing like the US News and World Report ranking. It's like, they're the top N colleges. Okay, I should try to go to the top college. That would be the best college to go to. Well, it's not necessarily true because colleges are not all the same. I mean, it's like saying, you know, I could read a book, any book. Well, books are different, so are colleges. And, you know, different colleges have different personalities, different things they're strong about, different kinds of students who go there, um, different kinds of experiences they lead to. And I think people are, you know, often too focused on there's a, there's a ranking and I got to go to the, you know, the top one. Well, you know, top for one person may not be top for another person. I think there are different, different categories of, of colleges and different categories of experiences that people get and, and different things like if you're going to be the top person at this not so you know college that doesn't have quite such amazing test scores of students but you're going to be a top student that may be a better experience than being kind of a oh i'm really struggling at this place where everybody has top test scores now you know and i think the whole world of colleges have been bizarrely at least in the us less so in in places like england i think although it, there it's happening as well have been so dominated by you know who's going to get the perfect test score, the perfect resume, the perfect whatever, and I don't even know you know it, it is a it is a bizarre kind of search for perfection in some definition of perfection. I don't really know what that translates into. I mean, as a person who sees often the output of colleges, I I I would say that the people who like you know there's a certain you know you take the most elite colleges, and in many cases, in order to sort of uh, go there, sort of lots of ducks have to line up. You have to, you know, perfect test scores, perfect, uh, uh, you know, activities, perfect this, perfect that. Um, okay, the kinds of people who get perfect test scores, if you uh, want to be the most creative, you know, discover the most interesting thing, may not correspond to the person who gets the best test scores. The person who's going to have the, um, uh, you know, the most tenacity, at uh, getting a project done, the person who's going to have the most creativity, the person who's be, going to be the most personable in dealing with other people, not necessarily much at all to do with test scores. Um, but yet that ends up being the filter that's used in many cases 
in, uh, you know, in determining, oh, this eliteness of college versus that. I mean, it's also worth realizing that a lot of what people, you know, the, the, I think the, the best reason to go to college probably is because you actually want to learn stuff. Um, and uh, maybe you want to learn stuff that you didn't already know you wanted to learn and so on. That's, but that turns out to be a pretty small fraction of people who go to college. Now, another fraction of people, they want to go into particular professions where you need to know certain kinds of things. You're going to be a doctor. You need to know certain kinds of things. And that's a process. That's a sort of ladder that gets climbed going through college and so on. I mean, there are also uh, people who like go to college as sort of a social experience and um, uh, both as a sort of a stage of life experience, which people, I think, which, you know, it, it's funny at different times in history, people have had different sort of that stage of life experiences. You know, they have to join the army. They have to do this. They have to do that. But anyway, they uh, leave the nest. They go off and do something. They launch their lives type thing. And that's the thing. That's sort of a reason to be in college. And, and then there's another thing, which is you're going to meet all kinds of people who form a kind of social network that, um, uh, will be relevant, interesting, enriching to you going forward. And that's another perfectly good reason to go to college. It's a little bit weird. It's like joining a, you know, a club of some kind. And it's kind of a, a weird thing because it's like you are, you're being selected supposedly for sort of academic reasons to join this club that you really are joining for reasons that have nothing to do with academics. Um, and that's a bit of a strange thing. And, um, you know, I, I noticed that, uh, you know, we have... Um, summer camp for high school students, summer school, we put on every year. And, you know, we, we get all kinds of very interesting applicants. We get very interesting people coming to our summer school and summer camp. Those people represent for each other an interesting network. We didn't pick them to be a network, so to speak, but we picked them for certain, you know, for, for, because they had certain characteristics. And then it turns out people like meeting other people who have sort of similar characteristics to their own. And I noticed the same thing at our company. You know, we've got a very interesting group of people and uh, it's always nice to see that people, uh, not everybody gets on with everybody, but it seems like an awful lot of uh, 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 great sort of, uh, uh, sort of relationships, friendships start up through just being people who were sort of selected for a different reason to have certain similarities end up being people that um, it's... Um, uh, that you you want to hang out with, so to speak, and and you know in the end, you know I went to uh, you know when I was in in um, in England, I I went to sort of a top high school called Eton, and I went to Oxford, and these are sort of top schools in this sort of English thing, and there's this whole notion of the old boy club, so to speak. Uh, hopefully now it's the old boys and girls club, but I'm not sure. Um, it always used to be called the old boys kind of network, so to speak, of people. Um, uh, who uh, sort of know each other from those things. And, and I, you know, I've lived in the US now for 40 something years. So I'm kind of a little bit out of that, that world, but I, it is always amusing to me, a little bit scary to me at my age that, that um, uh, you know, the people that I knew in school are the people who, who are running the country and things like this at this point. It's kind of like, um, uh, and I mean, it's amusing. It's a little bit, it's a little bit, terrifying at some level that these people that I last really knew when I was like 13 years old and now, and this actually some of them are even have done and are now retired from, uh, which is even worse, um, from, you know, being, you know, this uh, secretary of the treasury or whatever it is. And, in, in, um, um, and uh, uh, it's sort of, sort of interesting how that works out. And, and I think that there's a certain sense in which, oh, you meet these people, then you'll get to know them. It's actually different in different countries. You know, the US is a big country. Um, although sadly a bit stratified, so it, it, it uh, operates in some ways as a smaller country, but, but it's still, it's very big. There are other countries that are smaller where sort of everybody knows everybody and a certain, uh, certain sort of, of the people who are, uh, you know, involved in universities and government and this and that and the other. Uh, England is sort of an intermediate case of medium size, I would say. Um, but, you know, that's another sort of dynamic of universities is sort of concentrator for, for certain kinds of people for better, better or worse. Okay, let's see. I'm going to have to wrap soon. Um, uh, let's see. Boy, oh boy, oh boy, lots of interesting questions. <laughs>
Oh boy. Um, there's a question from Luis here. Golf balls have dimples that allow them to move faster. Why do cars and planes not have dimples? Oh, complicated question. Well, basically, if you want something to move fast, you want it to kind of slide through the air without making the air do, uh, do too many kind of get, kind of get into too much sort of complicated, messy motion. You'd really like it to be nice and streamlined so that the air just sort of slides past you. And depending on exactly how fast the air is going and how big you are, you need kind of different shapes. So for example, a plane that goes below the speed of sound needs a nose that has a certain form, a plane that goes around the speed of sound has a pointy nose, a plane that goes actually, a plane below the speed of sound has roughly a parabolic uh, nose, uh, uh, around the speed of sound, it's a pointy nose like the Concorde had. Uh, way above the speed of sound, it's a hyperbolic shape. Like the space shuttle has a very snub looking nose um, that uh, uh, didn't, didn't, didn't have that same form. Um, and um, uh, the... Um, um, that's my reminder that I need to go soon. Um, the, uh, in any case, the, the, the thing that... Um, uh, what happens in, it matters a lot, the, the layer of air right away from the thing that's moving past it, it matters a lot what, that, what, what the surface looks like. So for example, it can matter on a plane, for example, whether its wings are dirty or not. You know, washing its wings can make it, can make it have less drag, less that the air tends to sort of stick on the wings less as the, as the plane goes through the air. And there are lots of details, like the on a plane, on the wings of a plane, you'll see that you might think, oh, the plane's wings should be perfectly smooth, so it will be as streamlined as possible. But actually, they're not. So if you look on the wings of a typical plane, they'll often have a little, a little sort of fence, of little little things that stick up. Um, and uh, you say, why on earth would it have something like this? They're usually about a little bit less than an inch tall. Um, those have to do with affecting the detailed flow of air in the so-called boundary layer near the wings. The, the, the air away from the wings is like stationary and the air right at the wing is moving, is being pulled along by the plane as the plane flies through the air. Um, the, the details of sort of the transition between air is being pulled along with the plane and air is stationary is rather subtle. And those little fences are kind of a little bit like the dimples on a golf ball. They, they break up the boundary layer and cause the plane to be able to have less drag as it moves through the air. And th th there are lots of other details like that, but that's roughly, the rough story is yes, there are actually things like that. And there are lots of tricks for, for making, um, uh, for, for breaking up boundary layers and things like that. I think cars, I think cars sometimes have those kinds of things as well. Um, same, same kind of phenomenon. It's, it's a slightly, I could, I could expound about this at great length um, about the physics of fluids, but let me not do that right now. Um, the question here about, there's a question about Claude Shannon, um, who I unfortunately never met. Uh, I know many people who knew him, but I never personally met him. A uh, uh, question from Blue Banana, um, Banana. Um, okay. You say that in philosophy, everyone can think about fundamental questions. Why is that, why is that the case in philosophy, but not in physics or mathematics? Um, why does philosophy not have a similar rigid corpus of theory as the hard sciences do? That's a really interesting question. I think the main point is, okay, as a practical matter in today's world, there's a formal structure of knowledge in, in science and mathematics that is sort of built layer upon layer and the things we can do now are things where you can build sort of on top of that platform. In philosophy, I would say that there's less of such a platform that's been built. In fact, what's ended up happening in philosophy is whenever it starts building one of those platforms, the area of, of investigation in which the platform is built stops being called philosophy and starts being called natural philosophy or physics or something instead. So in a sense, philosophy is, is left with the things for which there hasn't been this same kind of layered uh, you know, platform built that allows one to then, then do things. So I think as a practical matter, what ends up happening is uh, 
to really you know, say something new in some area of, of physics, let's say, you're probably going to have to know a fair amount of that, those layers that have been built so far. Uh, it's less true in mathematics because of computer experiments where you can sort of parachute into some part of the sort of mathematical universe by doing a computer experiment without sort of visiting all the, all the intermediate state stages. But, um, in, um, uh, but generally, you know, if you want to make a contribution to sort of mathematics as it's written up in standard mathematics journals and so on, you kind of need to know all those layers, this platform that's been built over the course, last of the, the course of the last many centuries in mathematics. In philosophy, one of the things that is sort of perhaps, um, well, you know, I always used to make fun of this. My, my mother happened to be a philosophy professor in Oxford, actually. Um, and uh, uh, so I always used to say, if there's one thing I'll never do when I'm grown up, it's philosophy. And of course, needless to say, after decades go by, here I am talking about philosophy and, and uh, writing about philosophy kinds of things and, and so on. But uh, that's, that's what happens. Eventually, eventually the, um, uh, uh, you, know, you, you realize that the things your parents did, uh, hopefully you realize it more quickly, um, weren't as different from what you're interested in as you thought they were. But anyway, one of the things I always used to make fun of about philosophy is it's like, okay, we're in 1960 something or other, and how come you're still arguing about the same questions that Aristotle was talking about, you know, in, in the third century BC or whatever? Haven't you made progress in the last 2000 years? You know, and, and, um, uh, and so I think that's, that's sort of an interesting thing about philosophy is that in a sense, the questions and even some of the answers are sort of the same and you can debate them. And it's partly a feature of sort of the human condition, the structure of thinking, it hasn't really changed. But now, as I say, every so often, there's a sort of power assist that happens in philosophy, whether it's in logic and the formalization of logic and mathematical logic, building out that tower, building out the tower that became physics, building out other kinds of towers that that do have this sort of rigid formal structure and which will to some extent lock them out of being things that people that sort of anybody can have a, a, a you know a modern opinion about so to speak but i think that's not that's not the case with with many areas of philosophy and um, i think that the question of whether you could imagine making a sort of a rigid framework a sort of formal framework for different areas of philosophy it's a very interesting question i think that um, it's a question not unrelated to things that I've thought about. Um, you know, for example, ethics is one area where, in a sense, there is a codification of ethics that is needed for AI and things like that. Because, you know, ethics as thought about by humans, oh, it's a complicated process. You ask people, there are laws, there are these kinds of things that it's a, it's a slow thinking type process. But you know, the self-driving car that has to make an ethical decision about what to do, it's gonna make that decision in 50 milliseconds and something has got to be making that decision ethically, so to speak. And that's got to be sort of formulated in some formal way so that in 50 milliseconds, it can decide what to do. And so I think that sort of forces what has been a let's debate it kind of thing into a let's write code that does it kind of thing. And that sort of forces a different thinking, a more formal kind of thinking about questions, for example, in ethics. I mean, the same has happened in, uh, in questions in epistemology, ontology, these kinds of areas. Um, some of these questions, in fact, some of the things I've done both in, in, uh, in thinking about science in general and specifically in our physics project, kind of turn what have been kind of philosoph philosophical debate questions into questions which are really questions that where we can just say, here's this thing, you can do a computer experiment, you can see this happening, you can reason about it, you can formally reason about it, and, and you can make progress. And, and perhaps that will cause certain questions of philosophy to, to change their character and become more formal and become less accessible. I mean, I think some of these things, one of the things I always find interesting is these things which sort of start as philosophy, and maybe I heard about them when I was a kid as pieces of philosophy about, you know, Oh, references to things, you know, when is this thing referring to something that actually exists, you know, when you talk about the King of France, and whether the King of France is, is has this or that attribute, it's, you know, what does that mean if there isn't a King of France, what kind of a statement is that? Well, it's like, who cares? That's just something for the philosophers to debate. I don't care. Well, until I do, because I really care, because when we build our computational knowledge system in Wolfram Alpha, we have exactly questions about 
What does it mean when the thing you reference doesn't exist? And how do we, how do we deal with reasoning about things where the thing that you reference doesn't exist and what can we say about it? And when can we make an aggregate statement about things where some things exist and some things don't and so on. And so what started as philosophy ends up as code, so to speak, and ends up as something for which you have to make a formal structure. I think that over the course of time, the kind of computational paradigm is going to encroach further and further on what traditionally has been philosophy. And we're going to end up with a more sort of computational philosophy that, that indeed will be a more formal system and where certain kinds of things that have been matters of kind of every, everyday debate end up being things where there is a layer of formalism that one has to kind of, uh, that if one wants to reach sort of the frontiers of what can be talked about, one has to, one has to go through. All right. Well, I think um, uh, I'd better wrap up here um, and um, uh, uh, thanks for coming. I see there are questions I didn't get to today, which I'd love to, to answer, and I will try and go on again um, next week. So until then, bye for now. <laughs>